Hello, and welcome back to the Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and I'm pleased you could join me for the next part of my series on the wartime career of the SBD Dauntless Dive Bomber. As always, the major sources I use to prepare this can be found in the description, along with a link to my Patreon, if you like what I do here and would like to support my efforts. Now, let's get back into our story. In the last episode, we left the Americans and the Solomons after the first big carrier raids on Rabaul on the island of New Britain. This was the major Japanese air and naval base in the southwest Pacific, and the ultimate target towards which the Solomons Drive and the concurrent push through New Guinea were aimed. The harbor and airfield complex here were the last staging point for Japanese forces on their way to reinforce resistance to the Allied double advance. The carrier raids of November 1943, though not the first air attacks on the base, effectively neutralized the Japanese naval presence in the area and compelled the withdrawal of the remaining Japanese fleet units to bases further back, such as the one at Truk Atoll to the north. The withdrawal of the Japanese Navy from Rabaul meant that, for strategic purposes, the Salomons could be counted as secured. Heavy fighting here against large numbers of Japanese troops was by no means over, nor had the Japanese presence at sea and in the air been entirely eliminated. But the end was now a foregone conclusion. The possibility of a Japanese comeback had been rendered very remote. Salomon's campaign began to shift from an island-hopping offensive drive into a series of mopping-up operations against the Japanese garrisons still in action throughout the archipelago. As they had on their way up the chain towards Bougainville, dive bomber units worked in conjunction with squadrons of Grumman Avenger torpedo bombers, escorted by Hellcat and Corsair fighters. Against land targets, the strike planes would divide responsibilities. The Dauntlesses taking on smaller pinpoint targets while the Avengers, with their larger but less accurately delivered payloads, usually delivered in glide bombing attacks, went after larger and more dispersed targets. Common variation on this theme was the use of the SBDs in a flak suppression role, going in ahead of the Avengers to hit anti-aircraft positions and clear the way for the larger bombers. Depending on the effectiveness of the defensive fire encountered, strafing runs might follow the bombing attacks from all aircraft including the fighters, often repeated until the aircraft exhausted their ammunition. Attacks by land-based aircraft against Rabaul had been flown since autumn 1943 by Army Air Force medium bombers escorted by long-range P-38 Lightning twin-engine fighters. In the opening days of 1944, they would be joined by the Navy and Marines. The opening of Torquina Airfield on the shore of Empress Augusta Bay on Bougainville on the 10th of December 1943 put the Japanese base in range of land-based dive bombers. The completion of another field at Piva on the same island opened the door to larger attacks. On January 5, 1944, the first mission against Rabaul by land-based SBDs and Avengers was scheduled to be flown. Bad weather forced the cancellation of this strike, and land-based Dauntlesses would not strike the New Britain base until the 14th. On this day, 36 Marine dive bombers and 16 Avengers based at Munda attacked Rabaul with an escort of 80 fighters. The American planes staged through Piva on the way. They were intercepted by 84 A6M Zero fighters, but these failed to prevent the bombers from pressing through and making their attacks. Three direct hits were scored on the shipping in the harbor, along with 16 near misses. None of the ships in the harbor were sunk in this raid, but the destroyer Matsukaze was badly damaged. In the air combat, the Japanese defenders gave a good account of themselves, shooting down two of the Dauntlesses, an Avenger, five of the Corsairs, and two Hellcats for the loss of three Zeros. This raid was followed up by another on the 17th, in which 29 SBDs, 13 from the Navy and 16 from Marine Squadron VMSB-341, took part. The raiding force was again intercepted by a force of Zero fighters numbering more than 70 this time, but the bombers broke through the defense and carried out a devastating series of attacks on the Japanese merchant shipping clustered below. 15 direct hits were claimed, and five transport vessels were sent to the bottom. The Japanese fighter defense at Rabaul was formidable at this stage, but it was worn down rapidly resisting repeated attacks by Army, Navy, and Marine aircraft for the rest of January and the first half of February. On January 25th, the final Japanese air reinforcement was flown into New Britain aboard the carriers Junyo, Ryuho, and Hio, bringing the defenders 62 Zero fighters, 18 D-3A Val dive bombers, and 18 B-5N Kate torpedo planes. However, these aircraft would prove inadequate to withstand the Allied bombing offensive that was launched against the base in the second week of February. 
Three major raids hit the airfields here between the 10th and 13th of February. The first of these was itself a three-wave assault. First in came 59 SVDs and 24 Avengers, covered by 99 fighters, hit the Japanese planes in the Vanakanal field. Once they were finished blasting the field, they were followed by 24 B-25s and 20 Army fighters, after which a final wave consisting of 21 B-24 Liberator 4-engine heavy bombers and another 28 fighters wrapped up the day's attack. The Liberators put the field out of business temporarily with two hits on the runways with one-ton bombs. Many Japanese planes were destroyed here as well. This destructive treatment was repeated on the 12th and again on the 13th by attacking forces totaling more than 200 planes each day. Somewhat anticlimactically, a fourth mission to Rabaul was flown shortly after midnight on the 14th by two dozen Avengers. These were to lay mines in the harbor, and six Avengers failed to return from this mission. The mining of the harbor failed to prevent the arrival of a Japanese convoy escorted by the destroyer Yuzuki on the 17th. This, however, would be the last convoy to reach Rabaul. After this point, supplies would reach the Japanese south of the island only in tiny quantities and at great risk, most often brought aboard long-range flying boats or submarines. Late that night, the base was bombarded by the U.S. Navy's destroyer Squadron 12. They missed the Japanese vessels, which had departed earlier during the day, but fired more than 3,800 5-inch shells into the harbor nonetheless. Two days later, on the 19th, the last contested raid against Rabaul was flown. This was a two-wave assault. First wave of 48 SBDs and 23 Avengers escorted by Navy Corsairs, Hellcats, and Army P-40s attacked Lacanai and Tobera airfields. 36 Zeros intercepted this force over New Britain. In the ensuing melee, eight Zeros were shot down for the loss of one F-4U Corsair. After the Navy planes were gone, 20 B-24s and 36 Army fighters blasted Lacanai again, putting it out of action. The bulk of the Japanese air strength in Rabaul was withdrawn immediately afterwards. Later that day and into the next, 40 Zeros, 21 Vals, 4 D-4Y Judy dive bombers, 7 B-5Ns, and 13 G-4M Betty twin-engine bombers were flown off the island, most of these heading to the base of truck. 400 ground crew and support personnel were also evacuated aboard the transports Kokai Maru and Koa Maru, which were escorted from the base by a pair of subchasers. This evacuation left only 10 Zeros and a pair of B-5Ns at Rabaul. From this point on, the Japanese air presence in the Solomons area, although not totally eliminated, could be ignored. It, along with the Rabaul base, had been neutralized. The practical suppression of the Japanese air presence here also facilitated the Dauntlesses in their execution of their close support missions allowing them to concentrate entirely on delivering bombs on enemy troops and battlefield positions in support of friendly forces on the ground. Air-ground liaison and target indication was improving all the time, and while the American techniques were not as developed as those used by the Germans to coordinate ground attack planes with frontline ground forces, the results obtained were often just as decisive. In the case of the Bougainville operation, air-ground liaison teams were formed and attached to the ground formations three months in advance. Three of these teams were assigned to support the 3rd Marine Division, while two others were assigned to the New Zealand 8th Brigade Group, which supported the American operation on the island by securing islands in the Treasury Group, which lay not far offshore. An innovation introduced in target marking practice during this battle was the use of colored smoke. Experience had shown that the white smoke previously employed was too easily confused with the smoke produced by mortar or artillery fire. These methods were effective, but attack from the air on enemy forces engaged with nearby friendly troops, especially those in conditions of thick vegetation, still carried a good chance of accidentally hitting one's own men. Such an incident occurred during the fighting for a position on Bougainville called Hell's Apopin Ridge on the 13th of December 1943. In response to calls from American forces trying to crack the Japanese fortifications here, three SBDs and three Avengers from the newly operational Torakina airstrip launched a coordinated bombing attack. The American infantry only 600 yards, or 550 meters, from the targets. One of the planes hit the Americans instead, killing two and wounding six more. This appears to have been the only friendly fire incident in Bougainville involving close support planes, and it led to serious criticism of the usefulness of the attack plane on the battlefield in some quarters of the U.S. Army Air Force. The opening of the airfields on Bougainville, in addition to dooming Rabaul, changed the nature of the close support missions. 
The tactical situation in the islands had resolved itself into a series of operations to reduce the remaining Japanese forces isolated on the various islands. Thus, instead of clearing the way for an advance or blunting counterattacks, the SVDs found themselves hitting the same holdout positions again and again until these pockets were eliminated. Other raids were mounted on islands where American troops were not landed. The suppression of the Japanese Navy in the region, even these unengaged garrisons, cut off from supplies, reinforcement, or evacuation, impounded repeatedly from the air, were rapidly reduced to impotence. These troops trapped on their garrison islands were just as lost to the Empire as their counterparts that faced annihilation by the Marines or the Army where these had gone ashore. In some cases, the more fortunately situated were able to survive by clearing land and engaging in vegetable gardening and agriculture. The loss of these troops was doubly hurtful to the Japanese, as many of them were crack soldiers from the pre-war Imperial Army with years of battle experience gained against the Chinese. In addition to dive bombing, SVDs continued to fly other supporting missions. Principal auxiliary role, the Dauntlesses were overwater patrols looking for enemy surface craft or submarines, and they were now aided by radar in this task. These missions asserted control of the water and helped to build up the changing intelligence picture. Photographic reconnaissance was also a job for the Dauntless, and small numbers of photo recon variants were produced to carry it out. Navy SVDs would continue flying these scouting and patrol missions after the aircraft had been phased out of frontline combat squadrons. Dauntlesses also flew a variety of miscellaneous missions, including artillery spotting, familiarization flights for new pilots, practice bombing, and communications duty. With Solomons firmly in their hands, Americans continued to pound for ball from the air and to deploy new units into the line. Several more Marine SVD squadrons began to arrive in the theater, and these were employed in blasting the Japanese on New Britain and at other stubborn points of resistance. These units usually arrived first at Efate, in the New Hebrides, or what is today called Vanuatu, near New Caledonia to the southeast of Guadalcanal, where they worked up before moving forward to combat fields in the Bismarcks. Two squadrons, VMSB-241 and VMSB-341 reached Fate near the end of 1943. February 241 moved forward to Pivo, where it was employed in striking a ball, then later rebased to Amaral, to the north of New Britain. The individual flights of Squadron 341 were split up and flew missions from Fate, Munda Point, and from the strips on Bougainville. In April, it was reconcentrated at Green Island, one of those secured by the New Zealanders, so 125 miles or 200 kilometers northwest of Bougainville for more missions against Rabaul. Another squadron, VMSB-236, under command of Major William Cloman Jr., was also deployed into the Solomons Theater in flights, operating for Torquina, Munda Point, and Green Island in early 1944. Like 341, it was brought back together, this time at Torquina, from which it operated from August 1944 to January 1945. Other Marine SVD squadrons that arrived in the Solomons during 1944 included VMSBs 133, 235, 243, 244, and 142, which arrived at Amarau having come through Fiji rather than Afate. Squadrons were rotated in and out of the theater and spent unequal amounts of time on the islands, but on average, Navy and Marine dive bomber strength there had grown considerably. To take a snapshot at mid-year, June 1944, 13 squadrons flying Dauntlesses, 9 from the Navy and 4 Marines, were based at shore stations in the Bismarck Archipelago and supporting bases in the nearby island groups back towards Fiji. This was out of a total of 31 SVD squadrons operating outside of the continental United States. These planes and their ground crews were divided mainly among bases already mentioned, that is, Ifate, Bougainville, Green Island, Munda Point, and Amarau. They flew numerous sorties against targets all throughout the region, but as the year progressed, the bombing of Rabaul, which by now had become routine, accounted for a larger and larger proportion of the dive bombers' missions. As Japanese resistance elsewhere in the archipelago gradually was extinguished, these milk runs to New Britain would become a daily occurrence. Also in 1944 would the next and last mark of the Dauntless appear, the SBD-6. The Dash 6 model was virtually identical in appearance to the Dash 5. Major difference included in this final model was the use of a more powerful engine, the Wright R182066. This model of the Cyclone developed 1350 horsepower 
as compared to the 1200 horsepower of the R182060 used on the SVD5. The new engine also included standard automatic mixture control. And again, the additional power was partly nullified by the greater weight of the new power plant itself. Performance was improved, with the maximum speed boosted to 262 miles per hour, or 420 kph, a marginal improvement over the SBD5, but still slower than the prototype XBT2 had been. Thus, to the end of its production run, the SBD would merit its nickname, the Slow But Deadly. Operational ceiling was also improved, up to 28,600 feet, or 8,700 meters, from the 25,500 feet, or 7,800 meters, of the Dash 5. The biggest, though still modest improvement in performance was seen in range with full bomb load, which jumped from 1,115 miles, or 1,800 kilometers, in the Dash 5, to 1,230 miles, or 1,980 kilometers, in the Dash 6. This could be further extended to 1,340 miles, or 2,150 kilometers, by the use of two 58-gallon aluminum drop tanks. The main tanks themselves were improved, with the metal self-sealing compartments of the earlier models replaced by non-rigid bladder types in the new mark. The standard Dash 6 was also fitted with ASV, or air-to-surface vessel radar, which utilized dipole antennas underneath the wings. This technology, along with the extended range of the new model, enhanced the Dauntless's efficiency as a patrol and anti-submarine craft. This was fortunate as the SVD was being phased out as a frontline bomber as the Dash 6 entered production, and these sea control and surveillance tasks would be their most common missions in the field. The prototype XSVD-6 was accepted by the Navy on the 8th of February 1944, and a contract issued for the production of 1450-6 models. However, Thousands of these would be cancelled as production of the Curtis Helldiver got underway, and this aircraft began to replace the obsolescent SBDs in frontline carrier service. Between March and July of 1944, 450 SBD-6s were built at the Douglas plant in El Segundo, the final machine completed on the 22nd of July. But this plane, dauntless production came to an end. And that is where I will end this episode. Hope you found some of what I had to say here interesting or useful, and I hope you'll join me for the next episode of this series, when I'll wrap up my treatment of the SBD's career in the Southwest Pacific by looking at one of the few operations of the dive bomber on the other jaw of the Allied pincer on New Guinea. So I hope you'll join me for that. As always, I want to thank you for listening, and a special thanks to those who gave to my Patreon. Really appreciate your attention and support. That said, till next time, I remain Mark Seven, wishing you all the best.